you had just come back from Costa Rica? Yeah, not long ago. We went to, um, do you guys know what ayahuasca is? Oh, yes! So we did it for three nights. It was incredibly intense. I went to, everybody's journey is different. The second night, I went to, to hell for eternity. Um, yeah. And to just knowing eternity is um, like t torture in itself because there was no beginning, middle, or end. So you have like a real ego death. Wait, wait, now, now, how do you arrive and understand that that's what the moment is? Because is there a sign, next exit hell? <laughs> is it, I, I mean, it's, I, I was, it's your own psychological hell, basically, is the point of the medicine, right? This is a medicine that goes, it surpasses like anything you could do with talk therapy or like hypnotherapy or any of those things. It just goes straight into your soul and it takes you to the psychological prison that you hold yourself in. So it's, it's your own version of hell. And I was definitely there. Michael, the venerable Wall Street Journal had an article today called The Drugs That Power Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's talking about LSD, ketamine, magic mushrooms. The first line of this article states, Elon Musk tastes ketamine. Yeah. Is the stigma gone from these drugs? Like, it, it seems like this, these are like serious drugs. They were like... Schedule it, one drugs. Schedule one drugs. So, so it's just kind of interesting. That struck me before I knew you were going to be on today. I read that article this morning, and I was like kind of floored. That ketamine shit is a weird one because um, a lot of people do it recreationally, and apparently they, they blast off and go into other dimensions and shit. Elon Musk takes ketamine. Google co-founder Sergey Brin occasionally enjoys magic mushrooms. Executives at venture capital firm Founders Fund, which has invested in SpaceX and Facebook, have thrown parties that include psychedelics. Silicon Valley has long had a tolerance toward drug use, but while in the past routine drug use was squarely an after-hours activity, these days it's become embedded in corporate culture. What is ketamine like after a catastrophic in injury like that? Does it relieve the pain? Does it just put you in another dimension? But the, w the way that it feels is kind of, it, it takes your perspective and it's like, shh, it always felt like a whirlwind when they, if I was getting a push of it. But things, it's like you're starting to get your vision masked and uh, you're, pres you're still there, but you're dipping into like subconscious because you're still conscious. Because unconscious would mean that you're like, you pass out and you cannot have a gag reflex depending on how unconscious you are. So, uh, ketamine, I, I would close my eyes and immediately trip the most insane balls that you, <laughs> you could imagine and open them and I'd be back in the room and I'd be like, what the fuck? Whoa. And then a friend of mine, uh, when I left my first rotation, he was an Air Force CCT that got uh, blown up in the same village I uh, had a few casualties in. Uh, he stepped on ID, he's an above the knee, some f missing fingers, but when he was on ketamine, when he was awake and looking around, he'd see the walls on fire, and then there'd be like women, like white pale skin in the corners, peeling the skin off their back, and he was like awake, <laughs> and I was like, dude, that, Holy that's, shit. like whatever, I don't know, it must be like someone's psychology when they go in. And there's actually scientific proof that LSD could do just that. One study funded by the U.S. government in the 60s took a group of scientists and set them out to solve 48 different physics, math, and architectural problems. Problems that the scientists themselves had been unable to solve. Each scientist was guided through a psychedelic trip, at the end of which 44 of the 48 problems had found solutions. And psychedelics have a rich history in Silicon Valley. One of the most iconic users, Steve Jobs. I moved here to work in the Apple garage, building Apple once. That was 1976. That's Daniel Kotke, one of Apple's first employees. And before we all knew Steve Jobs as the creator of one of the most successful companies in the world, Daniel knew him as the guy he used to trip with in college. It was a spiritual thing. Steve and I developed a friendship when we figured out that we had both read this amazing book called Be Here Now, hmm. which is about psychedelics and spirituality. You said that Steve had said that LSD was kind of one of the best things he ever did. Why, why was that? It expands your consciousness. It could have been mushrooms, it could have been peyote, it could have been any number of other things. Conversely, Steve was never really interested in smoking pot. 
that did not expand consciousness. Today, psychedelic research is having a renaissance. People in the industry say there are more studies now than there have been in decades. So there was a lot of research done in the 60s and then a little, little bit in the 70s, but funding for clinical research, LSD, dried up. You see the most cutting edge of the cutting edge in San Francisco. I mean, you see people printing organs. You see people prototyping things that are fundamentally change how all of us experience reality. We don't know as much about the human brain or body as we think we do. I mean, we're absolutely medieval. I think we're going to look back in 10 years at our behavior now, and it's going to look like bloodletting in the dark ages. Aaron Rodgers, the NFL quarterback for the Jets, speaking for an hour during the conference about his use of ayahuasca, which is a hallucinogenic tropical vine. When you find that edge, old edge, and surpass it and create a new edge, you're creating in the in-between a beautiful new piece of life and energy and love and, and, and divine guidance that comes in that really changes your life. And we talk so much about, it, uh, about mental health, and to me, one of the core tenets of your mental health is that self-love. And that's what ayahuasca did for me, it was help me see how to unconditionally love myself. And it's only in that unconditional self-love that then I'm able to truly be able to unconditionally love others. Mm -hmm. And what better way to work on, for me in my own, this is my own belief, but what better way to work on my mental health than to, than to have an experience like that.